Boy, we have, we have quite a crowd here. They told me there's, uh, this is a record, 1,500 uh, people. And there's my friend Alan. He's wandering around there. Alan, great to see you. And Ann, is he staying out of trouble since he's retired? Yeah, well, don't worry. We'll keep you busy, Alan. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Jan, for your introduction. It's greatly appreciated. And thank you to the Rural Ontario Municipal Association and all its members for having me here today. And I think we're going to have a, a great uh, little convention here. And it, isn't, uh, it is great to be here together in person for the first time in two years. Just think how far we've come over the last couple of years. You know, just roll it back even a year ago. And just each and every one of you did an incredible job. You know, I, I remember last uh, January, there was lockdown, so on and so forth, but with all of your help, we were able to get through it and navigating the COVID-19 pandemic was a once in a century challenge, especially for small and rural communities. And I'm so proud of how I always say when people come up to me, oh, you did a good job in the pandemic. It wasn't about me, it was about Team Ontario. It was about all the companies and the communities, all 444 of them that were out there helping out. Obviously, the frontline uh, healthcare workers, they did an incredible job. To every one of our 444 municipalities, we all came together as a province, and that was the proudest uh, time of my administration. When you reach out to your, your partners, to, no matter if it's the councillors or mayors or wardens across the, the province, everyone really pitched in. So again, I, I want to thank you all for the work you did and continue to do to help keep our community safe and healthy. And as I've said before, small communities and townships of Ontario are the lifeblood of the province and our government will always, always have your back. So I, folks, I, I call Queen's Park the bubble. And uh, you're down there, you have a couple choices. And no matter if you're in City Hall too, my brother Rob used to tell me that, you know, you can either get stuck in the bubble and listen to a bunch of politicians, as I am too, and, and uh, the staff, well, PS staff, which are great people, or you can get out around the province and you start meeting the real people. And people wonder, I, I love how Robin gave her phone number out. I, I can see giving your phone number out is catching around the, the province. But you wonder why I give my phone number out? Because you have ears and eyes right across the province and you hear what's going on on the ground versus what's going on at Queen's Park. So I just love getting out and paying everyone a visit because we know that if our rural communities are successful and prosperous, then all of Ontario is successful and prosperous. <laughs> my, my friends, our government has a plan that's building Ontario. Whether you live in downtown Toronto or Sudbury or Thunder Bay and anywhere in between, we're making sure every single Ontario and every single person and community benefits from our investments to support economic growth and protect jobs. So the, the job numbers came out last month and you see around the world, you see the challenges, you know, they say economic slowdown and you see the US had two negative quarters and Make no mistake about it. Are we all going to see a few bumps? Sure. But I'm, I'm just not seeing it here in Ontario because all the hard work all the communities are doing and the cities are doing, you know, where do you see 42,000 job, jobs grow last month, another 30,000 the time before, and Vic Fidelli sent me a, a message. Where are you, Vic? He's probably out selling jobs somewhere. Oh, there you are. Our number, one of our number one salespeople, he sent me a message about the, the tech sector. And I've always said, yeah, we're second to Silicon Valley. But the numbers you, you sent me, and we hear there's some layoffs in the tech sector, but the numbers you sent me last night, Vic, were, were pretty staggering. You know, you see San Francisco area, Bay Area and everything, the, kind of the tech capital, they had 380,000 uh, jobs in the tech sector and they saw a growth from 2016, 2021 by about 14,000 people. And then you look, at, you look at Ontario, and just specifically, Toronto and Waterloo, we saw a growth of 350%. Those are pretty staggering numbers, Vic, when I, when I saw that. We have about 333,000 people in the tech sector, but here's the sec uh, secret little weapon. In Ottawa, you add another 80,000 people in the tech sector. 
So all of a sudden you're up to 413. So we're going to continue making that sector thrive and grow. So thank you for uh, sending me that information. And Vic, and let's, let's tell the rest of the world this is the tech capital now in North America. Our plan... Our <laughs> Our plan to build Ontario starts with building a stronger economy. As you all know, under the previous government, Ontario saw 300,000 jobs vanish as businesses fled to other jurisdictions, skyrocketing energy costs and overregulation, high taxes, uh, made it impossible for business to compete. They left in the thousands. Each of you know best how devastating it can be on smaller towns and communities. When companies leave, you could have a big employer in your company, and if they leave, that really affects the, the community. You know, they, they, there's always spin-off jobs from those communities, but those days are done, they're gone. We're making electricity more affordable and cutting red tape. We've kept taxes and fees low, and as a result, we have reduced the cost of doing business in Ontario by $7 billion a year. And that's $7 billion year after year after year. And I always say, if you, if, you know, we're, we all know we're in a world economy. And if we aren't competitive and we don't make our jurisdictions competitive, guess what? They're going down to the U.S. We're, our U.S. is our number one trading partner. We, we do about $400 billion a year with the U.S. of two-way trade. We're the number one trading partner in nine states, number two to nine other ones. So that's really our number one trading partner. But make no mistake about it, they'll go down to the U.S., they'll be able to go to Mexico, they'll go to Asia, they'll go to Europe. We're being competitive with the support of all three levels of government. I love when the municipalities work with the province, that work with the federal government. I'll tell you, we're unstoppable and we're attracting uh, huge international companies right here in Ontario. And since our government took office in 2018, we, I always say we all, because it's never one, one group or one level of government, we all have created over 500,000 new jobs all over the province in the last four and a half years. And these jobs, these investments, that's money that goes back into the businesses and into the community so they can invest and grow and create new jobs. I can tell you a story as a, as a, as a business owner myself in a small family business. We had offices in Toronto and, and Chicago and New Jersey and my dad always used to say, son, when you make some money, put it back into your business. Put it back into the technology, put it back into the people, put it back into buying new equipment and the infrastructure. And that's what companies are doing right here in Ontario. Because the vast majority of the jobs are created by small businesses. And our government is also revitalizing our auto sector. And this is a great story, helping to make Ontario an auto manufacturing powerhouse once again. We're securing billions of dollars in new investments, including Honda's uh, announcement of $1.4 billion in investment to retool its Allison assembly plant, and Stellantis and LG, historic $5 billion of investment to build Canada's first ever electric vehicle battery plant. And I was thrilled, this, this is a great story too, I think a year into uh, when we first got elected, GM was going and, and Chrysler at the time or Stellantis, they were leaving and Ford was thinking of going down to, to Oakville and actually General Motors, as we all know, ended up leaving. But guess what? They came back and they did the fastest build they've ever done in the company's history. And again, I was thrilled to be on hand at General Motors last December at Ingersoll as the first full-scale electric vehicle plant opened and the trucks came off the production line. As uh, Vic, as you know, in a little less than two years, probably closer to 18 months, the auto sector went from zero investment, leaving the, the province, to over $16 billion of investment. That's $16 billion going into communities. And they always say the auto sector, there's seven to one spin-off jobs. So it's absolutely incredible. And I want to thank each and every one of you for creating that environment. But friends, the real opportunity for Ontario, for all of Ontario, is realizing the full value of the electric vehicle supply chain. From the start, right up at the top, from the mining and manufacturing, and by the way, when it comes to mining uh, in the north, 
we have 34 of the most critical minerals that the whole world wants. Everyone's here wanting to get the minerals and, uh, you know, I have, I have one condition. I'm, I'm sure each and every one of you agree. We should never ever ship our critical minerals, no matter if it's the lithium or cobalt or graphite or nickel over to other countries so they can produce batteries in their country and ship it over to Ontario. It doesn't work that way. We, <laughs> we want to make sure the lithium and the cobalt and graphite and all our critical minerals stay here and we do added value. That's what I always say. Come over here, you can have our critical minerals, but guess what? You can open up a massive battery plant and stay tuned, by the way, a massive battery plant and create jobs here. And you can have our lithium. As long as you're manufacturing the batteries here, we'll be shipping them over to Europe. We'll shipping down to the US. And that, that's uh, what I strongly believe in really securing our critical minerals. We're going to build the cars of the future right here in Ontario by Ontario workers. Well, <laughs> Last year in Thunder Bay, I had an opportunity to stand shoulder to shoulder with some of the amazing miners. And I'll tell you, these, these folks are as tough as nails and they're, they're great salt of the earth. As, as our government launched Ontario's first ever critical mineral strategy, a five-year roadmap to better connect the industry's resources and workers in our province's north to our manufacturers in the south. And as it flows down, you know, I always say when it comes to the environment, it's not either or. I hate the either or, it's and. So we can be all environmentally friendly and create green, truly green vehicles. And that's where we have one up from our American uh, counterparts down in the US. They, they may be building green cars uh, powered by, by coal to manufacture those cars. When we did a great investment uh, over at uh, DeFasco and Algoma to truly make green cars, to, to switch over to electric arc furnaces, so you can't beat that. When you're saying you're producing a green car, and I was over at DeFasco, I think a week ago, a week and a half ago, and majority of their business is the auto sector. So we're actually producing that. And also, when you think of being environmentally friendly, it's about a transit system, not just here, it's right across the entire province, building the largest transit project in North America, getting people out of the cars. And the electric uh, arc furnaces, by the way, it's equal to taking two million cars. That's two million cars off the road. That's how we can be environmentally friendly and create economic growth at the same time. We're, Thank God I got Alan and Ann there, thank you. <laughs> we're, we're also strengthening the manufacturing sector in eastern and southwestern Ontario. Through our regional development program, we have invested more than $70 million since 2019 to help create more than 1,400 jobs. And we're investing in our province's agri-food sector, which is so important, with a goal to increase Ontario food production by 30% over the next 10 years. As someone told me, there's never been more food produced in Ontario than right now and over the last year or so. Helping to ensure our province's food supply chain remains safe, strong, and stable. Another, another priority, thank you. Another priority for our government is to find more ways to keep costs down for Ontario families. You know, each and every one of us have a choice when you get into elected office. You can either run it the way government runs it and just willy-nilly and don't care and just raise taxes, which I don't believe any of you believe in, or you could run it like it's your own money and it's your own business. And you can either raise taxes without even thinking of, of the people that get hurt the most. And by the way, it's not the millionaires and everything that get hurt, it's the common folk that gets hurt. We need together, collectively, to drive lean methodologies. I'm a strong believer in lean methodologies, doing things differently than we usually do, and it works. Thinking outside the box actually works. And the best ideas you get are from around Ontario 
from the business owners, small business owners, the common folk that work in an industry and saying, hey, let's try it this way. That's the way we can drive more efficiencies and reduce cost. Our government will always look for ways to put more money back into Ontarians' pockets because, again, folks, the worst thing you could do is tax the people and tax businesses. You tax people to death, they're getting taxed by municipalities, by the province, by the feds. They hold on to their money. They won't go out and stir the economy. But if you put more money into their pockets, they'll go out as simple, as simple as going out for dinner. As simple as going and maybe buying a sofa or a refrigerator, maybe doing a little renovation. And same goes for the companies. If you start taxing the companies to death, guess what? See you later, they're gone, they'll just leave. Because there's other jurisdictions that are saying, come here, we'll, we'll give you this, that, and the other thing. But when you don't tax them, they reinvest, as I said earlier, into their people, into technology. And it's, it's like economics 101, it works. We need to keep doing it. We've eliminated fees for license plate stickers and we cut the gas tax, a tax that impacts rural and remote communities most. You know, you, you see inflation, uh, one big, big part of it is when the gas prices go up, everything gets delivered, absolutely everything gets delivered. With a, with a truck or, or, or a vehicle or trains or planes that we rely on to deliver goods from one point to the other. Cutting the gas tax cuts the cost of these products and services. It's never been more important to offer hardworking people a bit of relief. And my friends, we can't talk affordability without talking about building homes. It's absolutely critical. We want to work with every single municipality. It's very, very simple. We've attracted economy, all of us. Our economy is thriving. Our biggest problem, you ask any business owner in the entire province, you can't walk down a street in this province in any sector without the businesses needing people. We're in desperate, desperate need to attract people. As you know, we're currently facing a housing crisis decades in the making, as previous governments refused to build the housing we needed, with our population expected to grow by over three million people in the next decade. We need more homes built faster, and it's 300,000 people over the next couple of years are gonna start landing in our province and landing in our country. But guess where the hotbed is? The hotbed is right here in Ontario. They want to come where jobs are and they, they want to lay down their roots and raise a family and start a business and become an entrepreneur. And we just can't have, you know, I've been in politics long, just like you, Alan. You just can't keep saying, not in my backyard. My neighbor doesn't want it, we don't want it. Where are we going to put these people? We have to build housing. And we have to be bold about it and, and take different steps to make sure that we have 1.5 million new homes across uh, the province by 2031. And that still probably won't even keep up to the amount of people that are coming, including a mix of ownership and rental housing types that meet all needs of all Ontarians, no matter if it's attainable housing. I'm a big believer a big believer in giving a person an opportunity to own their home. And no matter if the government has to give them a hand up, help them out, that's what we need to do because they're gonna take care of their home. And when I was on the campaign trail, I met, there was three, three couples, they were seniors, all different places. And they said, you know, I wouldn't be in my existing home if it wasn't for Bill Davis's plan. And I'm sure a few of you remember Bill Davis's plan, and obviously Bill Davis, one of the greatest premiers that this province has ever seen. But again, it was about attainable homes, helping them up and get a simple home. They can move on to a, maybe another home as their family grows. So obviously, right away, I made a few phone calls, pulled Davis's, uh, Bill Davis's plan out, and take the best ideas and modernize it to today's times. It's simple economics, it's supply and demand. We need to work together to build new homes to make home ownership more attainable for people. This plan includes building more homes in every part of Ontario. Ontario's small towns, our rural communities, they're also growing. And as our communities grow, we know that there's infrastructure needs to keep up. It's absolutely critical. But these are some pretty staggering figures. 
That's why we're investing a historic $86.6 billion over 10 years to build and expand roads, highways, and transit infrastructure across Ontario. And we're pleased to be supporting our indigenous, our indigenous partners in communities around the Ring of Fire in their work to finally build an all-season road. And it's, it's not just, it's, it's, it's not just uh, about getting to the ring of fire, it's about improving access everyday essentials like fuel and groceries and healthcare for those communities. This year, through the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, we're providing $400 million to 425 small rural and northern communities to renew and rehabilitate critical infrastructure, including roads, bridges, water, and wastewater projects. Another critical piece of infrastructure that is being long ignored is connecting all Ontarians to modern broadband internet. I always say, you know, roads are, are critical, right? The, the bridges are critical and the highways are critical. But a, a lot of people that I speak to in Toronto, uh, they're, they're absolutely shocked to learn that not everyone has access to the broadband and internet. And Ellen, you know, I can go up to Callanan and you're breaking up and you can't get access to internet. But in, in saying that, we're putting a tremendous amount of money and, and we're going to fix it and we're gonna get it done right away. As part of our nearly $4 billion multi-year investment, we're bringing reliable high-speed internet access to every single region of Ontario. Even the flying communities are gonna be high-speed internet. That's what changes people's lives. That's what changes businesses' lives when they're, they're in the uh, far north and they can't get internet service. But the good news is, it's all gonna be done by the end of 2025, which is pretty staggering. And I also wanna say, if you look at right across the, the board, we're putting, I was updated the other day, close to $200 billion. That's $200 billion of infrastructure over the next 10 years. I also wanna speak briefly about our healthcare infrastructure and, and how we're connecting all Ontarians, including those who live in rural communities, to more convenient care closer to home. And I have to mention, I, I, I say uh, she's an all-star, she really is, is my deputy premier, my right-hand person, the, the Minister of Health, and uh, what you're gonna hear from the Minister of Health and uh, Minister Jones in just a little, little while, and she'll tell you some of the initiatives and. You know, the last week was phenomenal. And, you know, the minister was out there and no one has more pressure on them in a government than the Minister of Health. It doesn't matter what party you're from, but the pressure that comes from health is absolutely staggering. But uh, Sylvia's done an incredible job. Another good Calden uh, gal there. And, and she's just doing everything she can. And last week's announcement was absolutely incredible, each and every one of them. But I do want to say that our government is making historic investments in health care. We're adding 3,000 more hospital beds across the province with 50 major hospital infrastructure projects underway. And there, there's very few communities that e either are not going to get an addition to their hospital we're gonna get a brand new hospital. We're investing in 50 infrastructure projects and we'll be investing more next year and the year after to a tune of $40 billion. That's $40 billion putting back into our healthcare system, including many outside major cities like, like Bracebridge and Huntsville and Collingwood and Brant and Grand River and just to name a few, I can keep going. People who live in more rural and remote parts of Ontario deserve to receive care in modern, state-of-the-art hospitals just like anyone else. And, and as, as we build new hospitals, we're expanding Ontario's health care workforce. We've increased funding to recruit, ret uh, retain, and train nurses and other, uh, other staff in the health care sector, including for our rural and remote communities. We're hiring health care workers has always been very, very difficult, especially in the, in the north. So last week, 
As a lot of you heard, Minister Jones and Minister Dunlop uh, unveiled our plans to expand the popular Learn and Stay grant. So this grant pays for all the costs of the tuition, books, and other supplies for students in high demand fields, including nursing, paramedics, and lab techs, in return for agreeing to work in an underserved area of the province, including our rural and remote communities. And we're making it easier, faster, and more convenient for Ontarians everywhere to access quality care close to home, and that is home care. We're a big believer in home care because no one wants to end up in the hospital. Uh, my friends, our government is creating the conditions for jobs to grow and businesses to succeed. We're working to make life more affordable for Ontarians and to keep in line with the theme of this year's conference. We're breaking new ground on new homes and new infrastructure projects in every community in this province, from North Bay to Owen Sound and everywhere in between. But as we navigate global economic uncertainty, we know there's more to do. We must all stay focused. We can't take anything for granted. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you to make a stronger Ontario and to make sure that every community in Ontario is the best place to live, work, and raise a family. I want to thank each and every one of you. Enjoy the rest of the conference and may God bless the people of Ontario. Thank you, everyone.